Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining our Sulphur Games webinar on February 7th, 2018. My name is Dan Eberhardt, and my company is Eberhardt Egg Solutions, and we are involved in the marketing and distribution of this very unique product, BioSol Premium Plus, that we're going to be talking about today at length in terms of the research and data that Elson Solberg has disseminated from the various plots across Western Canada today. Elston Solberg is joining us from an airport somewhere, as he is an international man of travel. You remind me a lot of uh, George Clooney, uh, Elston. Is that fair to say in that movie where he's collecting all those miles and he flies all the time? Does that sound right? Elston, are you there? Sorry, Dano, I'm here. <laughs> I couldn't figure, out how I, couldn't figure out how I, how I muted myself, so we're good now. I got it figured. Your witty response was only slightly delayed. <laughs> Sorry, man. Okay, so you're with me now. So you're a lot like George Clooney in that movie where you're flying all over and you're collecting all these points. Is that fair to say? Uh, that seems to be my life these days. Yeah, <laughs> in Orlando, Florida airport right now. Hmm. Did you get a chance to uh, visit the Mickey Mo show there? Or? No, that's tomorrow. tomorrow. Oh, nice! Very nice. I was in Tampa. I was in Tampa with Yara the last couple of days. So, yeah. Sweet. Okay, well, we'll get this webinar rolling so that you can enjoy your uh, holidays with your family there and um, the sunshine, and uh, we can all curse you since we're still in this uh, gray and brown, super cold existence up in Canada. But we're holding the fort for you. Well, thanks. To, I hope the guy, everybody on the call saw the uh, SpaceX heavy rocket takeoff yesterday. That was that's a really major turning point for humanity. There, holy smokes, that was amazing. I just caught the headlines, but is it true he sent one of his cars into outer space? Yeah, it's the first test of the heavy the SpaceX heavy rocket with uh, three boosters two strapped on on the main booster and they all landed, returned to Earth and landed on their pads and a Tesla is on its way to Mars. That's unbelievable. God bless Elon Musk. There's actually an interesting story if you read his biography about how he was involved in uh, Saskatchewan. He's got some history in Saskatchewan at one point. I think you've Yeah, the, bi the biography is awesome. It's awesome. It's very yeah. cool read. Very cool read. So the theme of our webinar today is the sulfur games and i just like to produce eye-catching marketing that will draw people in so i hope you guys enjoyed that and really it's all about joining the revolution the uh, hashtag biosol nation it's a new way of approaching your fertility reg regime and i correct me if i'm wrong also but i think guys that have gotten into the program guys and gals that have gotten into the program have experienced that essentially everything changes because it opens up a whole new world once you get that foundation of sulfur down that you can go on and approach your phosphorus and your potash and your nitrogen and your micros in a whole new way. Yeah, exactly. It, uh, it opens up all kinds of opportunity and, you know, three of the top uh, growers for the Canola 100 use uh, BioSol as a foundational management tool. Um, I'm working with two of them and they last year one of them placed third, this year one placed second and one placed fifth. So, um, yeah, it's changed the way they farm, for sure. Well, that's an interesting comment because we want everybody to be striving for Canola 100, and as we get there, as we go there, uh, it's going to come. Genetics and, and technology and farming practices continue to improve on a pretty st steady trend line there. Um, you're going to need more sulfur, and I don't think that can be achieved through regular ammonium sulfate just given the price point and given the logistics and the, and the bulkiness of that product. So you're going to need some sort of uh, form of sulfur similar to biosol. Well, I'm not going to have yeah, I'm not going to have a chance to say this, so I'll say it now. If you look at the Mulder chart, so everybody that's on the on the call, if you take a gander at the Mulder chart, there's one key nutrient that's missing, and that's sulfur. And the reason it's not on the chart is that elevated levels of sulfur enhance or stimulate or whatever the word you want to use uh, the utilization of all other nutrients in plants. Um, so a slow, steady supply of sulfur over the growing season, biologically delivered and 
you know, everybody in the call knows that I'm extremely biased towards the use of elemental sulfur in general, and more recently biosol, but slow, steady release um, that simulates the uptake and utilization of all of the nutrients seems to me uh, to be a pretty good idea. I'm a big fan of uh, stimulation of nutrient uptake. Uh, so, Elston, I'm going to play a game with you, and if I can stump you on more than three or I can, if I can stump you on three of these questions, um, when I see you next, you'll be buying. How does that sound? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Here. So here we go. So the first one is: Did you know that the name of sulfur came from the Sanskrit word sulver? From the which word? It came from the Sanskrit word sulver. Have you got my screen up? Oh yeah. There it is. I did not know that. Nice. Okay. I'm uh, one for one. I'm loving this. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Okay. Did you know, Alston, that a 150-pound human has about 140 grams of sulfur in his body? I would have not known that. So it's about one <laughs> gram per pound. Okay. So I've got, I've got 200 grams in me, roughly. 210. <laughs> Well, and getting less all the time because you're you're losing weight. Well, that's right. That's right. It's about the seventh common, uh, most common element in the human body. Okay, so I'm two for two. I'm feeling good. I'm going to get a free meal out of this. Did you know, Alston, that the yellowish color of Jupiter's moon Io is due to sulfur in a variety of states and forms? I did know that, but I you still did. owe you dinner. Well, no, you we're just we're just wait to see how this pans out here. Okay, fun sulfur fact number four. Sulfur is also present in many meteorites. Did you know that? And I was a space nut when I was a kid. I knew everything and studied everything about space. So I knew that one too. Okay, so it's uh, two for two. Two and two. Uh, two. two and two here. Okay, so this is the tiebreaker. Actually, I think that you know this one, so I think I'm buying you supper. Sulfur is non-toxic, but its compounds, sulfurous acid and sulfuric acid, are found in acid rain. You, you knew that, right? Yeah, man. See, I can only stump you on a couple here. I had to dig hard. <laughs> I had to dig hard, man. Okay, so here's what's going to happen, folks. I'm going to run through a quick, brief overview of Biosol, the product itself. And then I'm going to hand over the mic to the esteemed researcher and scholar and gentleman by the name of Elston Denzel. Solberg, and he is going to inform us of the the data and the research and the and the latest findings in the world of biocell. But I just want to break you down in terms of that elevator pitch here for use of the product. If you're a producer, here's how it works. I'm going to start today with the price point. I could start really anywhere in the scheme of, of value propositions for this product, but I'm going to start with a price point because I, I feel like it leads to all the other elements. So. We start with an extremely cost-efficient product. And, and what that allows us to do is to put on multiples of the actual pounds of the nutrient in such a way that really it would be really tough to achieve or next to impossible with other sources. So AMS, liquid sulfur, uh, impossible with something like S15. You just, you just can't get there. But what we can allow you to do, if you take a look at a chart here, which you'd find on our website, aberherdeggsolutions.ca, and you drill down to Biosol at the bottom there. So you've got urea at 475, you've got S15 at 700, you've got liquid sulfur at 420, AMS at 480, Tiger 90 at 420, Tiger 50 at 540, and AMS finds at 400, and Biosol at 280 delivered. Now, you can put your own prices into this calculator with one of our representatives, our trusted applicators, our, our dealers, and our marketers. But the reality is that Biosol is 18 cents a pound. And if you're buying urea at 475 and you're buying AMS at 480, that means that you're talking 52 cents a pound for the actual S in AMS, not to mention the bulk and getting it down. So with that price point, we have the ability to put extremely high rates on 220 pounds and with 70% of the, of the product being actual sulfur, if you bake it down in an oven, always guaranteed at least 70, sometimes 75, 80, 85 
most of the time, um, you're going to get at least 150 pounds plus of actual S, which if it amortized perfectly, which we know it doesn't, it's all agronomy. I mean, there's lots of factors on how it converts, but we know that it is highly available because of the rates, the variable particle size. That's 30, over 30 pounds per year over a five-year period. So that's where we get our five-year uh, logistical play. Um, does that all make sense, Elson? With the price point, we can then move into the agronomy, and the agronomy lends itself to the approach as well. So we put on high rates, we put it on top of the soil surface, we let it amortize out and convert to sulfate in its own good time with Mother Nature, and the catalysts for the conversion are the same catalysts that you'll have a good crop with. So we need the proper temperature, moisture, oxygen, and biological activity in the soil, which everybody's crazy about these days, biological activity in the soil. These are key elements to converting the product in the soil to the sulfate form that the plants can uptake. And with the high rates and the variable rate, we're seeing really good results, even in the first year, whether you'd apply it in the fall, the spring and the beauty agronomically is you're going to have more sulfur in all of your crops so while we don't sell it to you necessarily that you're going to have increased yields if you're not applying sulfur in between <clears throat> the canola rotation on those crops you're going to see some benefits where you didn't have sulfur before because we will say that having a good strong macro sulfur regime is foundational to, to good yields and growing growing bigger yields. And we're seeing that whether it's pulses or lentils or cereals or whatever it is outside the rotation of canola, we're seeing benefits on that. So agronomically, it's a low salt uh, index product. It's slow acidity versus fast acidity. It uh, converts with mother nature. So it's a biological process that's advantageous. We've got the compost in there. Uh, we're seeing a bump on macros and micros in terms of uh, the release of other nutrients from the sulfur. And of course, it does not leach until it becomes available through the biological processes which are required to convert it. So it's ideal in, in sandy high spots, for example, where you would typically get your ammonium sulfate leaching away. So it has a lot of agronomic advantages and it's interesting because there are different producers that like the product for different reasons. Um, a fellow like my brother will do a lot of things that are logistically painful because he's an agronomist by trade and everybody kind of winces. Um, I think a lot of producers do things logistically uh, advantageous and, and sometimes the agronomy suffers, but this is an intersection of, of, of the better qualities of, of, all those, of all those dimensions. So logistics... I don't know how it can get any simpler or any better. You put it down once. Now the product is a little bit uh, can be a little bit cranky to handle, but we have a fleet of uh, trusted applicators that can apply this. And if you're looking at putting this on with your own spin spreader, we can assist you with that as well. But the reality is, you're going to do one high rate application on top of the soil surface from any time that the crop is off and to freeze up. And the product has a little bit of moisture in it, so we don't tend to spread it in the coldest months of the winter but we can spread it again in the spring and we can spread it post seeding and the advantage is there. You'll smell that stuff baking on a really hot day on top of the soil surfaces. If it has a chance to oxidize on top of the soil surface all year, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's an excellent uh, opportunity for the, the sulfur to do its job converting. When we talk about logistics, this is one of the biggest plays that our producers key in on, given that if you're going into your local dealership, no matter what stripe or color you wear, uh, the latest and greatest high capacity seating units and tractors are a million to two million bucks. So if we can make your drill 15% more efficient by getting the sulfur out of the blend, you don't have to handle sulfur in the bins, you don't have to handle sulfur in the air seeder, and you're getting more efficient seeding with less filling and you're getting your seeding done faster, that does, we know statistically, lead to more yield. And I believe, I'm not an agronomist, but I think my brother said something at a certain date in May, you'll gain a bushel per day, <clears throat> or you lose a bushel per day by, by not getting that seed in the ground. 
one of the questions that people have is, can we spread this accurately? I fell in love with spin spreaders when it first came out on the John Deere uh, spreader chassis in 2004. You can see here that on the 60 foot width with the new leader, for example, we've got very even distribution, not only of, of particle size, but of volume. So we're getting the fines on evenly, which are the part of the product that's the most available um, most immediately. And so that's what we're concerned with getting on evenly and the bigger particles sort of take care of themselves. But we've been able to spread this really accurately and part of our trusted applicator program and our contract is that guys do regular pan testing and ensure that the product gets uh, put on. And in my experience, uh, we haven't had any um, visible issues of, of application of this product. And if you were able to get vials across a an air seeder and take a look at the the accuracy of, of uh, placement of product, you'd probably be surprised at the variation there. So the price point leads to the agronomy, leads to the logistics, and of course, one of the fun parts of the story is the sustainability. This is a bigger and bigger train everybody's gonna be getting on. The company that's manufacturing this product is going to take away 30, 37,000 metric tons of grocery waste is gonna get made into fertilizer that's gonna be put on farmers' fields this year. And that's a huge story that we need to jump on and we need to promote and we need to sell to consumers that we are doing the right things and we are good stewards of the land and all that good stuff. So I think it's a great good news story that we're diverting landfill material and making it to a fertilizer that's the lowest cost per pound sulfur on the market that's logistically advantageous and agronomically superior. That's my elevator pitch. How did I do, Alston? All right, so we're getting this technology figured out here. My computer blew up, so now I'm running join me off the phone. <laughs> we're good, we're good. So uh, good morning, everybody. It's Elston here. I'm just going to talk briefly a, a little bit about some of the third-party research that's uh, been done out there. There's other third-party stuff that hasn't come in yet, um, and we're anxiously waiting for that, but I uh, just wanted to share with you a couple, three projects that have been done by third-party uh, folks, and uh, I guess over the last couple of years, uh, there's been um, a lot of folks looking for this third-party research, uh, presumably because uh, Elston is now corrupted by the evil biocycle people. Um, even though I've done elemental sulfur research for about 38 years of my life with every possible source out there, and I'm a big believer in elemental sulfur in general. I uh, have been for a long time extremely biased towards its use and more recently uh, seeing the advantages of using large amounts of biosol. So the, the third party stuff you're gonna be seeing is uh, just that and um, you know, we can have a big long discussion about the value of it and the, you know, all that good stuff, but it, I think it's important to share some of this with as many people as possible. And uh, if we just look forward, so New Era is a research company out of the Swan River area in Manitoba. And the first slide that you're looking at is uh, a small plot research uh, program that's going to go on for a couple, a couple three more years, um, where uh, sulfur sources were applied either pre-seed or post-seed. In this case, we're looking at yield per, uh, in terms of pounds per plot. So, um, so you got the untreated check, four replicates in this trial. You got uh, Tiger 85 at 110 pounds per acre. You've got ammonium sulfate at 30 pounds per acre, either pre-seed applied or post-seed applied. And then you've got biosol at, uh, at the regular 220 pounds per acre. And when the statistics were run, there's no statistical differences between any of those treatments, which um, depending on how you look at it, is either a really good thing or maybe not such a good thing. Um, and you'll notice that the post applications of sulfur, all sulfur sources, um, regardless, uh, I mean, keeping in mind that there's no statistical difference, uh, seems to be some, somewhat better, which might be a bit of a surprise to most of the people on the call. Um, if we go forward, Dano, now we're looking at uh, 
tissue samples from that same trial, and um, and again, statistically, um, not a lot of difference. But uh, you can see that the post-applied materials seem to be increasing tissue levels, um, total sulfur levels in the tissues as compared to the preceded application. Um, keeping in mind again, that statistically, there's there's no difference here between the treatments. So depending on how you look at it, it's either a good thing or a bad thing. I tend to think that one of the main first objections with growers or with agronomists is uh, there's a ton of agronomists out there that will look growers in the eye and tell them that elemental sulfur and especially biosol, it will not be available in year one. And uh, this complete nonsense. Uh, we figured out how to make elemental sulfur available in a very short period of time. Uh, back in 1982, when I uh, finished up my master's thesis, um, and we weren't putting on the large amounts that we are uh, today with either Tiger or Keg River or now with Biosol. And it, it's really simple. You just broadcast it on the soil surface and you forget about it. And you're going to get sufficient release in a short period of time. Um, and I guess that's evidenced uh, possibly with these these field trials, or uh, small plot trials in Swan River. Okay, Dano, next one, please. Um, here's some tissues uh, at the bud stage, and things are jiggling around a little bit. Uh, there's no no statistical difference here either. Keep going. Here's a 20% bloom, no statistical difference again, and uh, all three sulfur sources seem to be kicking in slightly better than the check. Keep going, Dano. Now, now we're going to a feed, field scale trial. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not replicated enough to do any meaningful statistics, but we got the untreated check. Um, and if you look at the soil, soil samples, which I don't have, this the field scale trial had a was on a sulfur deficient soil, and the small plot was on uh, on a soil that had higher levels. But you can see the untreated check: 220 pounds of biosalt, 440 pounds of biosalt, and the grower standard of uh, 30 pounds of ammonium sulfate. And again, statistically, uh, there is a difference between the three sulfur treatments and uh, and the untreated check, but between the sulfur treatments, there is no statistical difference. Next, Dano. And this is just, uh, again, the tissue samples taken at three different growth stages, seedling to bud, uh, bud to pre-flower, and then at uh, about 50% bloom. Um, and you can see that, uh, that the untreated check is generally speaking uh, lagging, especially when we compare um, that to the 440 pounds. But again, um, you know, we've got some, some field yield data that uh, suggests positivity from all sulfur sources, and we've got some tissue samples um, from uh, three different growth stages that, in my mind, is showing a uh, good release of sulfur and uptake by the, the crops as compared to the untreated check and an area of the field that was deemed to be uh, significantly lower than the, in sulfur than the rest of the field. Next, Daniel. So now we're going to go to Sarda. Um, these guys put out, put out a trial for me. They were supposed to put out three. They put out one. Um, if you can just go to the next one, they're up in the Flare area of the Peace River country. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, what they did is they put they put the sulfur on uh, very late, uh, actually at bolting in July, which is would not be my ideal idea uh, idea of putting on any kind of sulfur, uh, never mind elemental sulfur. But uh, you can see the yields um, from the four different treatments statistically uh, not significant at the 95 percent confidence level. Um, what the results are, what they are, and again, I think um, you know, putting on the material at that late growth stage, a lot of people uh, would say that that's not a great idea for any sulfur source, never mind elemental sulfur. And um, yeah, but you can argue that there's a bit of a yield increase there. 
they have sent off the samples for tissue analysis. So again, this is replicated four times. Uh, the tissue analysis is not in yet. Okay, Daniel, keep going. Now I'm going to go to Field Quest Consulting, uh, Brent Tarasoff put these trials out uh, a while back and uh, basically all he did, if you go to the next one, is he put out 0, 300, 600, 900 and 3,000 pounds of biosol sulfur. This was applied to a field that had been previously limed. Uh, Brent uh, tends to be quite aggressive and quite um, uh, quite a good agronomist as well as a good researcher and now what you're looking at is the amount of sulfate sulfur in the zero to six inch depth that was obtained on those uh, treatments, zero, 300, 600, 900, and 3,000 pounds. And I think for me what this data shows is that a soil test, even in, the, in an awesome circumstance, um, is pretty much useless for identifying um, when to pull the trigger on the second application of biosol or the third application depending on where you are in the cycle. Um, really, uh, the only time we, we had significant, significant amounts of sulfur accumulating in the soil was when we had very, very high rates of application. And so, uh, depending on how you look at this, for me, it's uh, another piece of information that tells me or suggests to me and hopefully to you that soil test is kind of useless when it comes to identifying reapplication. So that's the sulfate sulfur in the soil. The next slide is the tissues from those various uh, rates of application. And uh, you can see that as we go from 0 to 3,000, there's a gradual increase in the amount of total sulfur in the plant. But it looks to me like once the plant hits about 1.6% sulfur, uh, it kind of uh, limits out. And uh, 1.6 is way, 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 way above uh, the expected range and as I mentioned earlier on the call the Mulder's chart hasn't got sulfur on it because sulfur enhances the utilization of pretty much all nutrients and what we do know from recent uh, research in the literature and so on um, elevated levels of sulfur increase the level of glutathione in the plant and that glutathione uh, acts uh, sort of like a, uh, a stress reliever and we're finding too in the literature that um, when plants take uh, in um, large amounts of sulfur they create they reconfigure that back to elemental sulfur in the plant and that actually acts as a um, almost like uh, like an antibiotic in the plant um, glutathione is a phytoalexin which is a stress reliever and there's uh, lots of different things uh, that we've been bumping into as we go down the, the elemental sulfur uh, rabbit hole. Um, more on that later. Next, Daniel. And then pH. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of agronomists will look you in the eye and tell you that uh, elemental sulfur is not available in year one, and uh, they're not sure that it will be available for a number of years. And then in the next breath, they'll also tell you that it's going to acidulate your soil. Um, and I don't know how the two work together, I, how uh, elemental sulfur won't be available, but it will create acid all at the same time. It's nonsense. Um, elemental sulfur is a slow-release biological product that um, is governed by particle size and dispersion, and so if you have small particles, those will convert very rapidly if you apply it properly. Um, and then the bigger particles will release over a period of time and it's slow biological release. Those same agronomists won't tell you that every fertilizer we apply, with the exception of potash, uh, also creates acid and ammonium sulfate is the most acidulating of, of the commonly used fertilizers, even more acidulating than elemental sulfur. They won't tell you that, um, but this experiment provided a, a good opportunity to see what the impact was of these uh, increasing rate 0, 300, 600, 900, and 3,000. And um, you, you might argue that at the 3,000 rate, the pH has come down a little bit. Keep in mind, this field has been previously limed. Um, and you can see that there's a, fair, a bit of noise between the different treatments. So statistically, I'm not sure if that, uh, if that 
pH decline at 3,000 is real or not, but I don't think there's too many people on the call that are going to be putting on 3,000 pounds at a go. And um, it's just more information to either refute or confirm um, who's, who's ever idea about the utilization of elemental sulfur. So we've got sulfate sulfur, we've got tissue sulfur, and we've got pH as measurements, as well as a whole raft of other things that we could talk about. But uh, for today, that's all we're going to yak about. One thing we did notice with this trial as well is as the sulfur rates increased, the um, levels of other nutrients in the plant also increased. The great example of Wallace's law, we see this over and over again in the tissue samples uh, from, you know, 80 to 85 percent of the fields that have received biosol. Um, the sulfur levels elevate and uh, so do the calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and micros. And uh, I could show you that, but I, I didn't prepare a slide with that for today. So I think that's all I have, Daniel. Um, three, four examples of uh, some third-party research. There's more coming, um, and i uh, be more than happy to share that when it uh, is finally available. So thanks for the opportunity, Dan. Absolutely. Thanks for that enlightening uh, data there, Elston. Can you speak a little bit? You, it, it, you've had many lives, different careers. You've been a researcher professionally. Can you just speak to the overall pantheon of, of research third party and uh, the research from the agronomists and I guess what you'd call data from the farmer level? Where does it all fit in? Where are you guys going with this and what have you seen with BioCycle, uh, BioCell Prima Plus in the last couple of years here in Western Canada? Well, in general, uh, you know, the third parties, well, okay, so... I'll back up to third party. Third party research is awesome, but um, it's really difficult for third party people if they're not um, really uh, comfortable with sulfur to find, to, to quite simply find sulfur deficient fields. It's really, really difficult in today's world because most right. growers are paying more attention to sulfur, especially in the canola part of the rotation. So it's really, really hard to find sulfur deficient fields. And when you do find them, um, you know, they're like gold from heaven. And thank God, first year, we, we, we found a few fields that were extremely deficient in sulfur. Um, what I'm finding with the bulk of the third party work um, is that we simply aren't on sulfur deficient fields. So you, it's, it's difficult. Having said all that, um, you know, the preponderance of the uh, tissue samples that are coming back from literally hundreds of uh, fields that have had biosol applied to them um, in the past, you know, three, four years, the sulfur tissues are, generally speaking, extremely elevated, which is a really good news story because um, of all of the stuff we're discovering in the literature with the phytoalexins and the glutathione and the reconversion of uh, that sulfur back into elemental sulfur inside the plants and on and on and on. So we're, we're learning a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, so for me, for me, um, the best research, in my mind, is farmer-scale research, strips across fields. Uh, with AgriTrend, we developed a statistical tool that is academically uh, recognized as appropriate and, and fair. And, um, and with, if we run strips across fields and we use that tool uh, to statistically validate the findings that we have in strips across fields, I think that's absolutely the future of research um, in agriculture because farmers farmers farm variability and sulfur is a nutrient that is extremely variable across fields and um, what we need as an industry um, to determine is how do crops respond to whatever treatments whether it's sulfur, elemental sulfur, whatever it is that we're putting on in strips across fields, we, we need to get that information to farmers because they farm entire fields, not little pieces of fields. And one of the, one of the shortcomings of uh, small plot replicated trials is in, a, in any given field with any given experiment, the simple placement of uh, that experiment can give you 
quite different results. Um, you know, I always use the example of a trial that we did years ago at Three Hills, where if you put the trial in the sulfur deficient area, um, sulfur would be the most important nutrient to humanity. And if you put it in the part of the field where there was enough sulfur, you would, as a you know, a, a, a typical researcher, you would find that sulfur is not necessary. And uh, something like 75 or 80 percent of the field was obliterated by sulfur deficiency. So I don't know if I'm answering your, your question, but at the end of the day, the combination of uh, long skinny strips across fields, tissue tests to identify sulfur levels in plants, um, not using uh, soil tests to identify reapplication, all of those pieces of the puzzle um, is basically where, what we're seeing over and over again in all of the trials that we've been doing, whether they're field scale or properly situated small plots. I think you answered the question very well. What I wanted to know was where you feel the best value is in uh, placing your research dollars and your, you know, the credence of what of what gets done. Because I think there's a lot of different options of how to uh, get information back from various sources. I think a good example is the research that was done at New Era and Swan River is excellent. It shows uh, what we've been saying all along that. Um, our program is equivalent in the first year to, to other sources of sulfur and sulfur-sufficient soils. If you've already got a good sulfur program, this is really just a better way to continue on with that, uh, especially, you know, first year, all things being equal, but you look at the price point, logistics, and agronomy. Um, what you're going to see over the years, though, is where people aren't putting on 30 pounds of ammonium sulfate that's where I think you'd see a big differential. And we do have a large producer that I am going to be sitting down with and, and speaking directly with and getting all the facts and figures about the scenario. But a large producer in, in the Swan River area contacted me directly to tell me that they had put uh, this biosol on a tract of land that they had just taken on that hadn't had that uh, continual high fertility program that a lot of our producers are on. And he saw an amazing difference in yield, right? Because, I mean, if we can, you're right, if we can find these sulfur deficient uh, soils, then it might look like a miracle cure uh, from that vantage point. But that's what you're finding is it's pretty rare. Um, I mean, the New Era Ag uh, research that was done, I spoke to Megan yesterday, and I'm hoping she'll come and speak about this very topic at the Trusted Applicator Summit in February 20th and 21st here. Uh, it was not on sulfur uh, deficient soils. And my brother, who runs a pretty extensive, uh, you know, research program in itself on his own farm, trials to beat the band. I mean, again, he puts a tremendous amount of work logistically into discovering what's the right thing to do agronomically. And it's extremely painful for everybody. Um, he didn't find it was any miracle cure either given that he's had a high fertility sulfur regime for a long period of time. Now, uh, should those, uh, you know, that sulfur run out over the years on a check strip, you're going to see uh, a bigger differential. But uh, I, I think the yield that we're, we're selling or we're preaching would come from having a proper sulfur regime throughout the years where maybe you're not putting as much, as much sulfur down over time. I totally Totally, Dan. I guess for me, I get really frustrated with, uh, you know, some of the stuff that's bantered about out there in the industry. I mean, um, we figured out how to use this stuff back in the 80s. So I don't know what that is. It's like 30-some uh, years ago, and we're still up against the same old, same old. And I, I think a lot of it, it just has to do with guys being lazy. And I, I don't know how how we can look growers in the face and tell them the stuff that, that's being told out there but at the end of the day carpet bombing with uh, tiger keg river biosol um, is a great solution every crop needs sulfur every year we know that we, we you know in the in the wheat trials uh, that we monitored this year um, with sulfur applied you know one two three four years ago high yields high protein consistently higher protein in the treatments that have uh, elemental sulfur in the biosol form. Um, I know Daryl Carlisle in Manitoba had some startling uh, protein results there too. And, and 
you know, I think I think you're right. Um, you get on a large amount, and you provide sulfur to uh, every crop every year for a period of years. It's just like how much simpler can it be, and how much more agronomically pure can it be? Um, it's like a no-brainer. It's an absolute no-brainer. But we'll continue doing the research, and we'll continue doing that with third third-party folks, and. Uh, Hopefully, by the time uh, the smoke clears here in a year or two, we'll have convinced most folks in the industry that uh, that this is 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 as real as I know it's real. Absolutely, and we we acknowledge and respect everybody's request for data. And uh, there's a lot of producers out there that won't move ahead without without the hard data. And we're going to endeavor to do more uh, more trials across Western Canada, various shapes and sizes. We did have a. A question here from Matt Mays, who's uh, been a big uh, supporter of ours. We really appreciate you being on the call and uh, talking to your agronomic producers about about the product. And um, he's with a group of producers this morning. They want to know, Elston, if we spread Biosol this spring and then we pro-till after or this fall, what effect would that tillage operation have on the elemental sulfur? So it's a great question, Matt, and uh, and this is uh, what I've come up with. So back in the day, we figured out that we could use um, Tiger or Keg River. Um, we could apply it in the fall. We could apply it through snow, a little bit of snow. We could apply it in the spring, and we could apply it after seeding as long as we put it down at elevated rates. And we're not talking the 100-pound rate now. We're talking... Uh, 3x the normal rate, so 45 to 50 pounds back in the day. The reason that worked with those products is that if you just broadcast it on the soil surface or all of those different timings, um, the bentonite and the pastille would absorb water, it would fracture, and then subsequent rainfalls would disperse those particles and optimize the contact with the soil. So um, that's Tiger 90, that's Keg River. Now when we move to Biosol, the dispersion issue is eliminated because all of that hard dispersion work has been done in the compost pile. So we've got a product that ranges from about one micron to about 4,000 microns after it goes through the spin spreader. And there's no dispersion required. There's no, there's no bentonite clay that, that needs to absorb water and expand and break the particles down. They're broken down as small as they're going to get after it goes through the spin spreader. So in my mind, uh, a little bit of tillage should should not be a problem at all. It should maybe even enhance uh, conversions somewhat because now the, so the contact with the soil um, is even a little bit better. So a lot of people have been throwing that question out and been worrying about, you know, well, I, I, I heard that if you put on elemental sulfur, you can't till for a couple, three weeks because of the, the rainfall and the dispersion thing. I think with, with, with Biosol, all of that dispersion, all of that um, particle size stuff has been done in the compost pile and through that spin spreader that's rotating at 800 to 1,000 uh, RPMs. So I hope that answers Matt's question. It's a really good question. Absolutely. No, that's awesome. Uh, we have another question here from Tom Bone. Uh, a man who uh, is uh, close to my home area there. And he asks, have you seen any protein increases in barley in year two or three after biosol application? Okay, so I'm, I'm imagining that he's worried about uh, protein in malt barley. And um, one of the misnomers in the industry uh, when it comes to malt barley is that one should not apply sulfur to malt barley because sulfur creates protein. Couldn't be further from the truth uh, because if you've got a field that is variable in sulfur, parts of that field will suffer a yield decline because of inadequate sulfur. And what does a crop do when uh, yield declines even in parts of the field? It concentrates nitrogen as protein. So um, if you're if he's worried about about uh, malt barley, the the only the, the two main things that impact protein and malt barley is lack of moisture and too much nitrogen. Um, if you've got sulfur in place to balance a proper ration of nitrogen and other nutrients, 
for the yield goal that you have and you have enough water, um, you, won't, you will not see a protein bump that's specific to sulfur. If, on the other hand, he's uh, asking about uh, silage barley or something like that, then, of course, your nitrogen rates are higher. Uh, typically, for a bushel of malt barley, I would recommend 1.3 pounds of nitrogen, maybe 1.2. If I'm going for silage barley or for feed barley, I'm cranking 1.6 to 1.7 pounds of nitrogen per bushel because um, of you know you want to you want to push yield and you want to push protein and all of that sort of stuff. So at the end of the day. I'm not sure which angle he's coming from, but um, if the concern is malt barley, the, the sulfur is not the issue uh, when it comes to protein. The, the issue is with nitrogen management, uh, assuming that there's adequate water for the, the yield goal that people are, are shooting for. Yeah, I think that would be... I think I think that would be fair to say that's his, his concern, and he, he was uh, thankful for you answering that question, Elson. And, and Tom, another great guy to talk to who's a disciple of Elston's and an agronomist and uh, and a farmer who's using biosol is my brother, Terry, and I think they had one of their best years ever with malt barley last year. So you could talk to him about his his direct experience on the farm growing malt barley. I think it's If been, I could uh, just continue, uh, the guys that placed, placed second and fifth this year um, in the Canola 100, carpet bombed their entire farm uh, in the fall of 215 at 300 pounds of biosol per acre and last year I, I think they averaged something like 124 bushels of malt barley across their farm and it uh, was all malt. So um, yeah there's all kinds of ex kind of all kinds of those types of examples across uh, the network of people that are using biosol. Awesome. It doesn't look like I have any other questions at this time, and if that's the case, then we can uh, certainly wrap it up because I know you're on the way to uh, hanging out with uh, Mickey Mouse and various other Disney characters. I expect to get some uh, selfies with, you know, Mickey Mouse and uh, Snoop Dogg. Um, who else would be out there? <laughs> well, that's right. They have Star Wars now. That is a big deal. That is a huge deal. I did, yeah. I didn't put, I didn't put that together. But that's a whole other dimension. Good for you. Um, just had one more text. Okay. Well, we just got some thank yous and thumbs up and uh, some positive feedback from the webinar. And we hope it provides value. The the reason that we did this, guys, is because we know that everyone wants to to have the data on this pro, uh, product. And and my feeling is everybody likes the concept everybody wants to use the product but they just need that extra degree of information and hopefully we provided that to you today as a service now elston if we were to um, offer to people that you might um you might be available to speak with them um or how would they reach you uh, I don't how would we go about getting a hold of Elston Denzel Solberg? Hey, uh, just share my email address and my phone number with everybody, and uh, yeah. probably e email is the best way to go for the next little bit. Um, I'm, but uh, yeah, just share my number, my contacts, and I'm ha more than happy to help people. Okay, can you give me your email here? sunmountaininc at gmail.com sun. sunmountaininc at gmail.com okay Inc. you know the story right Solberg stands for sun over mountain like in Norwegian that, that's what it means <laughs> sun over mountain we talked about that the other day and what's your uh, what's your bat phone my bat phone is 780 Seven eight zero nine zero six five six nine zero. Yeah, man. Perfect. If I'm not if I'm not hanging with Goofy or Chewbacca, I'll be good to go. Awesome. Okay. Well, if we don't have any other questions at this time, thanks everybody for attending. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, 
we have lots of biosol available for you guys this spring to to get on and to get applied and to get ammonium sulfate out of your lives and improve your your operations and save some money long term so uh check out your local trusted applicator at aberhardagsolutions.ca or contact me directly and we'll get you suited up with some some product and and go from there so good luck everybody enjoy the rest of the winter season until we hit spring it's not going to be that long and uh we'll see you out there in the field thanks elston see you guys have a great day all right take care everybody thanks so much